Last Sunday, Daria Dugan went kaboom. A bomb was placed inside of her vehicle, it exploded and killed her. She is most notable for being the daughter of Alexander Dugan, but she was also building her own career in fascist journalism. Who killed her? What do we know about her father, the much more influential figure? Was he the target? Who did the assassination? And why exactly could Alexander Dugan have been targeted if he was the target? What do we know about his system of beliefs? Is he Vladimir Putin's brain, pushing neo-Eurasianism all the way to the Kremlin? Let's talk about it. Daria Dugan, the daughter of Alexander Dugan and fascist author and writer and speaker, was killed over the weekend when a bomb was placed inside of her Toyota Land Cruiser and blew up around 9 p.m. over the weekend. It killed her, tore to shreds, and also tore her vehicle to shreds. What's interesting about this explosion is it's actually expected that Alexander Dugan, her much more influential father and modern theorist around neo-Eurasianism, was supposed to be in the car. But last second, he decided to not go in the car and actually take a separate vehicle away from a cultural event they were both attending. Uh, Alexander Dugan was on the scene minutes later. There's a some video and photos of him that are circulating around of him holding his hands to his head, looking around in shock as he finds out the news that his daughter was killed by a assassination, which is what this was. The bomb was placed in the car. This wasn't a freak accident. This was an assassination. If you were to ask my opinion and the opinion of most people examining this, it's probably the case that Alexander Dugan was the target of the attack, but they accidentally got his daughter instead. Maybe they were trying to get both of them at the same time. Obviously, I can't assert that with any like blueprints of the assassination attempt, but it would make much more sense for any assassin to take out Alexander Dugan, considering he's much more influential, he's much more well known, he's much more politically divisive than somebody like his daughter, who is still politically divisive, but much less influential and having a lot more professional time. But I can't assert that 100%. So take that as my personal opinion. We don't really know for sure who did this. I mean, I have personal suspicions. I think everybody has a suspicion one way or the other who did this. Ukraine, of course, being the first nation everybody pointed their fingers at, immediately denied any involvement. They actually said, Ukraine definitely has nothing to do with this because we are not a criminal state, which the Russian Federation is. Uh, that was said by the advisor to the head office of the president of Ukraine during a televised address. And even more so, we are not a terrorist state. Now. Russia is actually not buying that and they're accusing Ukraine of carrying out the attack. Uh, they actually gathered some evidence in a very quick period of time in under 48 hours to make an accusation that it was actually an Azov assassin. This information was gathered by the FSB and I'm just going to read you what, according to their story, would be the official timeline of events. A Ukrainian woman, part of the Azov regiment, took her young daughter and cat to Russia months ago. She then planted a bomb in Dugan's car, killing his daughter after trailing him. She then drove right away to Estonia with her daughter and cat still in tow while leaving her ID, which the FSB retrieved to make this accusation, that's their piece of evidence, leaving that behind. And it just so happens to be the exact ID that can be proven that they are part of the Azov regiment. And what a lucky, what a lucky find for the Russians too. It happens to be an Azov agent as well. Not just any of the tons of other agents it could have been, but it was an Azov agent. As far as I know, Azov isn't an intelligence agency of some sort. So this is quite confusing. Of course, the story sounds highly improbable, but it becomes even more improbable once you find out the fact that the ID that they presented to the press has obvious signs of Photoshop, which, you know, with the signs of Photoshop, the improbable story, and it just so happened to be an Azov agent who took their daughter along the assassination. It just doesn't make sense, you know? And with Russia's tendency of lying, it's, it's kind of hard to really buy the story. I mean, is it 100% impossible? No. Is it unlikely? Yeah, but some Russian analysts have actually gone further than the FSB have, accusing the United States and the United Kingdom of having involvement with their intelligence agencies, saying that the Ukrainians could have never carried this out on their own, which I do agree with. I find it hard to believe that the Ukrainians would work so hard to get an agent in the area of Moscow, only then to go after the daughter of Alexander Dugan, or possibly Dugan himself, when they could have used that agent to do a million other things, not to mention it's hard to imagine them getting the agent there in the first place. But some have actually gone further than that. Political analyst Yugor Kalamagrov, who told the Russian outlet Pravda that the attack was no doubt prepared by the United States and British intelligence services and carried out by Ukrainian saboteurs. He then claimed that Kyiv itself could not have planned such a daring sabotage. Does he have any evidence, any photographs, anything to tie this to the United Kingdom or America? No, but he has a dream, doesn't he? And can you really blame a man for that? And while everybody was throwing accusations back and forth, a new challenger approached. The National Republican Army. Ever heard of it? 
Me neither. And so has nobody else until a few days ago. According to former Russian MP Ilya Ponorev, claims it was actually an anti-Putin Russian partisan group. This group is allegedly called the National Republican Army and wants to overthrow Putin's government. Ponorov said partisans inside Russia were ready to conduct further similar attacks against high-profile Kremlin-connected targets, including officials, oligarchs, and members of Russia's security agencies. They actually released a manifesto, which you can read online. It's published publicly. I'll just read some of the manifesto. You can check out the rest of it yourself. We declare President Putin a usurper of power and a war criminal who amended the constitution, unleashed a fratricidal war between the Slavic peoples, and sent Russian soldiers to certain and senseless death. Poverty and coffins for some, palaces for others. This is a reference to Vladimir Putin having a grand palace as revealed by Alexei Navalny to the public. We believe that the disenfranchised people have the right to rebel against tyrants. Putin will be deposed and destroyed by us. No lies detected, honestly. Now, personally, I find the idea of Ukraine doing this highly unlikely. I don't think they have the resources. It doesn't make sense what the FSB is alleging. Their sign of Photoshop on the ID card. The story doesn't really make sense. So Ukraine to me is highly unlikely. And until Russian media can come forward with hard evidence, any idea of American or MI6 involvement is silly to say the least. Now, I also don't necessarily buy this thing about the National Republican Army. Out of nowhere, this group has just sprouted up and I'm supposed to just believe that this is a real thing and they actually carried it out. Now, the reporter who said it isn't an uncredible reporter. The MP is a reporter as well, not just a former MP. He's not uncredible, so I'm not completely dismissing it. But, you know, group comes out of nowhere and claims responsibility for an attack. It's kind of hard to just take them at the word. So, you know... Maybe that's the case, but I got to wait a little longer until I see more evidence of that. But there is something that a lot of people are talking about online and I don't think is completely implausible and I do want to suggest is also a possibility. It is perfectly possible that the FSB or some other faction within Russia actually carried this out. There's a lot of factions within the Russian government and within the Russian oligarchy that really hate each other. And it's a time of real tension and economic decline in Russia. There's a lot of economic problems within Russia. I actually talked about how the Russian economy is collapsing in a recent video and it wouldn't be that crazy to see that friction where a lot of oligarchs are kind of just disappearing the economy is going into the toilet to start seeing people you know start fighting in a less than polite manner but again all of this is speculation is it the fsb we don't know is it ukraine probably not but we don't know was it the national republican army maybe i mean that would be crazy but maybe but that doesn't matter to the Russian government. They seem to have already found their culprit. They're going with the FSB line that it was Ukraine. And we're actually expecting to see some repercussions in the coming days. The United States government is saying that Russia intends to get some revenge for this attack by launching a lot of missiles across Ukraine, hitting civilian targets. We're going to have to wait and see how that goes. And I'm not just saying that based upon American sentiment or American press releases or government statements. If you look across Russian media, this is the same sentiment that's being pushed there. And if you look at what Alexander Dugin's saying, then, you know, it's not completely out of the imagination. Kiev will shudder, said a headline on Russia's Sargrad TV website, while state-run RT editor Margrita Semryoyan retweeted a call to bomb the Ukrainian intelligence agency headquarters in Kiev. Dugin personally responded by saying, Our hearts yearn for more than just revenge or retribution. We only need our victory. My daughter daughter laid her maiden life on its altar so win please so who is daria dugan well like i've said before daria dugan is most notable for being the daughter of alexander dugan a russian philosopher who we're going to get into later but also she has her own career even though she is a trust fund baby and a golden girl uh, when it comes to her relationship to her father mostly she's gone a lot of state-run publications like russia today and sargrad to you know give anti-Ukrainian and uh, pro-war takes and opinions. She wrote for the International Eurasian Movement, which is her father's organization. Again, trust fund baby. But basically, she would go in front of any far-right camera that would allow her to go in front of a far-right camera to give her far-right talking points. Whether it be Sargrad, RT, or some other far-right publication, or a lot of times just right-wing YouTubers, Russian right-wing YouTubers that would listen to her and give her a platform. She was slowly trying to build her social media presence and political presence through making connections to her father. Just like her father, she actually had sanctions placed against her for spreading disinformation about the war. She actually called Bucha a false flag and said that the Ukrainians chose the location of Bucha because it sounded like the word butcher.
Also, like her father, she has dabbled in mysticism. She went to the rubble of Azovstal after the Battle of Mariupol. She went to the location where the Russian uh, soldiers were used to fight the Ukrainian soldiers. You know where the Ukrainian soldiers were held out. She went there and she looked around the room and was like, oh, oh goodness. And she said this on camera, by the way. She So she actually meant this when she said it. She's not just fibbing. Like, this is what she said on camera. Oh, this... This, this room, it's filled with so much Satanism and, and black energy. Satanism and black energy. Serious political commentator. Also, during her last interview, before she passed away, she encouraged war crimes against Ukrainian POWs. It wasn't the first time she's encouraged crimes against Ukrainian POWs, to be clear. But she specifically said on this occasion that... They needed to put Azovstal defenders, which would be Ukrainian POW, uh, POWs from the Battle of Mariupol, on pikes and let local residents decide what to do next with them. So basically, torturing and murdering Ukrainian POWs in front of, since this is Ukrainian occupied territory, Ukrainian civilians. She's also dehumanized Ukrainians and called them subhumans on multiple occasions. В каждом городе, подобно Гаги, должен быть создан трибунал, который будет расследовать преступления вот этих не людей, а это уже не люди. И здесь, конечно, нужна идеологическая работа, и нам нужно всерьез понять, в чем состояла их идеология, а это идеология смерти, и в чем состоит наша идеология. Это тоже, на самом деле, вызов и самим нам. Oh, and a word on that quickly. The, there was a report released last May by the New Lines Institute that's talked about genocide in Ukraine and the possibility of Russia committing genocide against the Ukrainian people. It was titled an independent legal analysis of the Russian Federation's breaches of the genocide convention in Ukraine and the duty to prevent, you know, really rolls off the tongue. But the conclusion of the report was reasonable grounds to believe Russia is responsible for direct public incitement to commit genocide and a pattern of atrocities from which an inference of intent to destroy the Ukrainian national group and part can be drawn. And two, the existence of a serious risk of genocide in Ukraine, triggering the legal obligation of all states to prevent genocide. And the reason I'm bringing up this report not only is because you guys should go read the report. It's only 42 pages long. It shouldn't take you too long. You could do it in a day and it would give you a lot of knowledge about a lot of war crimes that have taken place in Ukraine up to May of this year. And I'll also tell you a lot about international law. But the reasons they listed for why they came to this conclusion where I think there was like a five, six or maybe seven reasons. But a lot of the reasons they listed, she met the criteria of as in she performed this behavior. This includes conditioning the Russian audience to commit or condone atrocities. Like I just said, she was openly calling for war crimes against Ukrainian POWs, like torture and public executions. Accusations in a mirror. An accusation in a mirror, by the way, if you don't know, is a perpetrator accuses the targeted group of planning or having committed atrocities like those the speaker envisions against them, framing the punitive victims as an existential threat, makes violence against them appear defensive and necessary. So when she's talking about them being, you know, subhumans, when she's talking about them all being fascists and Nazis and evil Satanists that are committing all these untold war crimes, like executing POWs, which she will then go advocate for herself, this would be an accusation in the mirror. The denial of the existence of Ukrainian identity, her as well as her father believe that Ukraine doesn't have a right to exist and that they're little Russians, as in they're not Ukrainians. And of course, dehumanization, which she did by, of course, calling Ukrainians subhumans on this occasion that I showed and on many, many other occasions. So she's not a good person, not a good person at all. But what about her father? As I've said multiple times before, her father is much more influential, much more powerful, and has affected the ideological flow of Russia a lot more than she ever could or ever did. So what about her father? Well, Alexander Dugin is one of the biggest supporters of the invasion of Ukraine that you could possibly find. In fact, he's been advocating for the invasion of Ukraine for over 20 years. He is an ultra-nationalist, mysticist, and an ultra-fascist as well. He's most well known for being the leading scholar of advocate for neo-Eurasianism, which is something we're going to get into later. So let me give you some background of Dugan. Let's talk about a lot of his earlier days, starting in the 80s. He joined and became a leader in the Pyamyat Society, serving in its central council from 1987 to 1989. Uh, it is a hardcore nationalist organization. Uh, it is well known for its anti-Semitic origins, tying itself to some of the same organization from Russia's past that committed pogroms against the Jews, which was mass killings and mass deportations against the local Jewish population of Russia. Uh, the Pyamyat, though, deplored Soviet-style communism. It was a lot more of a kind of like a Russian chauvinistic, Russian nationalistic organization pointing back to, again, 
that older style Tsarism and monarchist system that it would like to bring back to Russia. It was strongly Orthodox Christian, and as I said before, it specifically drew a lot of his ideological heritage from the Black Hundreds, and as I said before, they were actively involved in pogroms of the Jewish community during the Russian Tsardom. Alexander Dugin made friends with an ultranationalist writer, Alexander Pranikovov, and became a regular contributor to his ultranationalist analytic center and newspaper, Den. This is when you could actually start to see his geopolitical framework form. He wrote a 1991 pamphlet there called The War of the Continents, in which he described an ongoing geopolitical struggle between the two types of global powers, land powers, or the eternal Rome, which are based on the principles of statehood, communality, idealism, and the superiority of the common good, and civilizations of the sea, or the eternal Carthage, which are based on individualism, trade, and materialism. In Dugan's understanding, the eternal Carthage was historically embodied by Athenian democracy, the Dutch and British empires, and now is represented by the United States. The eternal Rome is embodied by Russia. For Dugan, the conflict between the two will last until one is destroyed completely. No type of political regime and no amount of trade can stop it. That means if you're like a liberal internationalist that believes in like globalization, or you believe the idea that trade between borders can stop uh, conflict, as many that I agree with, I agree with that tendency, I agree with that ideal of uh, international liberalism, he completely trashes that. In fact, he is a hardcore opponent of globalization entirely. In order for the good, Russia, to eventually defeat the bad, America, he wrote, a conservative revolution must take place. Stefan Schinfeld actually talked a little bit about how the conservative revolution impacted Dugan's view of the world. A crucial to Dugan's politics is the classical concept of conservative revolution that overturns the post-enlightenment world and installs a new order in which the heroic values of the almost forgotten tradition are renewed. With that framework, it's easy to understand why he was joining Tsarist organizations in the late 1980s, even though it was the 1980s and not the 1880s. Julius Avola, who was a Italian reactionary slash paganish fascist, kind of hard to pin him down exactly, was somebody that Alexander Dugan wrote a lot about when talking about the conservative revolution. He actually called him a central figure to his conservative revolution in his mind and even translated his books when he was younger. Now, I'm sure many of you in the audience have heard of Nazbols. Well, Dugan was king of the Nazbols. Actually, he was a founding member of a Nazbol movement in Russia, specifically the Nazbols, the National Bolshevik Party. When it comes to being a Nazbol in the modern age, the National Bolshevik Party was the Nazbols of the modern age. I mean, they were the National Bolshevik Party. Uh, if you look at their symbols, it is very obvious that it's not of a liberal variety and is of a, a very fascist and communist variety from Alexander Dugan. The idea that these two ideologies can be brought together, the radical right and the radical left, was something that he trumpeted around this time. And again, he wasn't just a member, he was a founding member, dealing mostly with the ideology of the movement, the ideology of being a Nazbol. And so he was instrumental in the Nazbol movement within Russia. It was even said once that the ideology of the National Bolshevik Party was fully generated by one man, Alexander Dugin. Dugin then took this ideology and ran for the Duma and got an astonishing 0.8% of the vote and did not succeed whatsoever. He then proceeded to leave the party in 1997. But no need to worry for Dugin. That was gonna be the year 1997 where he shot up to prominence due to his most influential work being published. The work that would take his earlier thoughts about the eternal Carthage and the eternal Rome and really flesh it out. This was the year that he wrote the book, The Foundations of Geopolitics. Now, The Foundations of Geopolitics is kind of hard to explain without a little bit of a history lesson before we get into the craziness that was this book. And I promise you, whatever you're expecting to be in this book, you're going to be surprised by. Because it's out there. But first you need to understand what Eurasianism is because you can't really understand exactly what this book is about before understanding Eurasianism. Eurasianism fundamentally is the idea that Russia is a unique state due to its geography. That it's not a uniquely European state or a uniquely Asian state. It has territory both in Asia and in Europe, which makes it a Eurasian state. And due to that uniqueness, it needs to act uniquely. And it needs a unique form of government. This ideology was actually formed in 1921 when Russian exiles who had fled after the communist takeover of Russia published a collection of articles titled 
Exodus to the Each, which marked the official birth of Eurasianism. The book talked about how Russia is tied to its land, that its land is the fate of the nation state, and that the ruler must secure those lands in order to rule correctly. Given Russia's immensely large size, its leaders must be imperial, consuming and subjecting the diverse populations across the nation. They hated, you know, open economies, they hated democracy, they did not smile upon uh, a lot of local governance, they hated Eurocentrism, they wanted to look more towards Asia, and they generally just hated most secular freedoms. They were very authoritarian, to put it bluntly. There was some ideological diversity amongst the Eurasianist camp. There was a pro-Soviet camp that believed that the Soviet Union was an evolution and eventually the communism would fade away and produce this Eurasianist state that they have in this mind, in their mind, this Eurasianist empire. Well, of course, there was also the anti-communist bloc, was like, which was like, no, this is an atheist state. This was a state that believes in communist ideals, that believes in giving the proletarian power. This is silly. This is ridiculous. The Eurasianist empire cannot be formed until communism is done away with. This ideological diversity also included some pretty unsavory folks, including just out and about neo-Nazis in the United States, and even actual Nazi collaborators in Belgium, who supported the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and looked at it as the start of a Moscow-Berlin axis of power. Now, Dugin's type of Eurasianism, neo-Eurasianism, started to come about after the Soviet Union fell. This form of Eurasianism was uh, not really more concerned about, oh, we just need to be uh, less Eurocentric, and it just became just straight up like anti-Western, anti-United States, anti-Atlanticism, anti-European Union, anti-NATO. I mean, it, it, the, the fundamental point of Neuro-Eurasianism and its difference from normal Eurasianism is NATO sucks, screw Atlanticism, screw the United States. We need to be able to take on the United States if we're going to, you know, build this new neo-Eurasian totalitarian order. So what exactly does he call for in this book? What is his prescriptions to build this Eurasian empire and stop the United States, the Atlanticists, etc.? Now, this is a doozy, so I'm just going to read them one by one and try to contain myself. He first proposes a Moscow-Berlin axis. This would include possibly giving Berlin, you know, the German government, Kaliningrad, which is currently Russian territory, and control of Central Europe and Eastern Europe, where there is a majority of Protestant and Catholic uh, populations. Uh, this would also include a Moscow-Tokyo axis, as well in return for territory that would be given back to Japan in this imperial, like, grand bargain. He recommends personally giving them the Kurels, which is a, you know, some island chain, in order for Japan to join the side of the Moscow-Berlin axis and Russia against the United States, because then Japan could redevelop its power over the Pacific and take on America. He, uh, he also just, like, straight up says that Japan should make its own new order in the Pacific, which kind of, like, brings back 1930s, 1940s Japan vibes. Alexander Dugan's, like, actively dragging the corpse of Hirohito out of the grave in Tojo, just, like, poking him with a stick, like, going, come on, build empire, come on! He believes that the United Kingdom should be cut off from Europe, so, you know, Boris Johnson, Alexander, uh, Axis right there. He believes, I shit you not, that Romania, North Macedonia, Serbia, Serbia, Bosnia, and Greece, the Orthodox Collectivist East, will unite with Moscow as the third Rome, the official successor to the Roman Empire. And then they will use that power as the Roman Empire to reject the materialism of the West. Azerbaijan is to be split up between either Russia and Iran or just straight up given to Iran. Georgia is to be dissolved and have parts of it annexed. Wait, par that's already partially happened. You're going to find that actually with a lot of this is like, once you read like parts of these, you can see like, not the majority of that didn't happen, but you can see tiny little details, tiny little details happening. He suggested it possibly dismembering Turkey using geopolitical shocks, like sponsoring rebellions of Kurds and Armenians. This sounds like something out of like this, like 16 or 1700. Again, this was written in 1997. Russia was at its lowest point. He proposes a Moscow Tehran axis, as in the Iranian state. I mean, a lot of axes here. You would think, as you know, a Russian, the word axis would kind of, you know. Be an immediate turnoff, but I guess not. 
This would be in order to control the Caucasus. This would include control of Central Asia, including Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and just throw in Mongolia for good measure. This helps him reach the warm seas of the Indian Ocean, which would be strategically useful. So that's just all those territories grabbed. All those independent nations grabbed. But don't worry. If you thought China was going to be left out of this equation, you'd be wrong. He actually believes China should be split up. China must, to the maximum degree possible, be dismantled. I know that's surprising. He proposes the annexation of Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, and Manchuria for security reasons. To compensate China, don't worry China, you're going to get a good deal out of this. They're going to offer Indochina, not Vietnam though, the Chinese, the Chinese have learned the lesson there. Even, even the even the Russians are like, nah, even Alexander Dugan's not crazy enough to invade Vietnam again. He's like, no, 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 no. I've, I've learned enough by watching both the United States and China invade. Nah, I'm not, even, I'm not touching that. I don't care how powerful the Eurasianist Axis is going to be. The, the, the new Axis, Axis 2.0, Electric Boogaloo, we're not touching Vietnam. The Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia. So that's Indochina, not Vietnam. The Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia. China gets the kangaroos. He also, of course, proposes large swaths of territory throughout Europe to be annexed, including Finland, Belarus, Moldova, Lithuania, and Latvia. But Estonia, this surprised me, he's going to give that to the German sphere of influence. Yes, he's generous to the Germans for whatever reason, but not generous to, you know, everyone else who is being annexed. And of course, Ukraine is to be annexed as well. He justified the annexation of Ukraine saying, Ukraine as a state has no geopolitical meaning. It has no particular cultural import or universal significance, no geographic uniqueness, no ethnic exclusiveness. Ukraine represents an enormous danger for all of Eurasia and without resolving the Ukrainian problem, God, he was like that close to saying the Ukrainian question, the Ukrainian problem, it is in general senselessness to speak about continental politics. Basically what he's saying here in his mind, it is essential to conquer Ukraine before you could carry out the rest of the Eurasian dream. That Ukraine would be one of the official, uh, one of the first essential steps in creating this Eurasian empire. And that it has zero right to exist, no matter what Ukrainians would say, or the long history, which even Voltaire talked about in the 1700s, this long history of the Ukrainian struggle for independence, the uniqueness of the Ukrainian language, uh, Ukraine having its own music and culture, all of that wiped away because he wants to create the Eurasian Empire. And you can you can see like throughout the years, this view of Ukraine still being present, not only from his support for Ukraine today, but in 2014, this was when, you know, Russia annexed Crimea and they started invading the Donbass. He said, Ukraine has to be either vanished from the earth and rebuilt from scratch, or people need to get it. Dugan said in, a 20, in 2014, as a political crisis in Kiev served as the pre pretext for the Kremlin's initial land grab next door. Listen to this. I think kill, kill, and kill. No more talk anymore. What a lovely fellow. But don't worry, Americans. I know this is all that stop you. The, the whole plan, everything we just read, is in large part to stop the United States, to counter the United States and Atlanticism, the, the alliance between America, and NATO, and the European Union, to counter that. And that's the only way they're going to ever bring about, the Euro bring about the Eurasian Empire and bring about the multipolar world is by taking on America. So what's his grand plan? Is he going to land troops in Virginia? Is he going to land troops in California? Or are they going to take back Alaska? I mean, you know, with all of these, these crazy ideas, I'm sure that that's what he's going to propose. No, he actually proposes something different, something we've actively seen him engage himself in. He says this on chapter five in the chapter, The West Threat on page 367. It is generally important, Dugan wrote, to introduce geopolitical chaos within the American daily experience by encouraging all manner of separatism, ethnic diversity, social and racial conflict, actively supporting every extremist dissident movement, racist sectarian group, and destabilizing the political processes within America. This is also why you see uh, pictures of Alexander Dugan pop up with the former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke, or the recently disgraced Spanky Tanky, Caleb Malpin. He's going and hyping up the political fringes, hyping up racists who, who could cause racial conflict in the United States, like David Duke, hoping, praying 
that they'll either a start some sort of civil conflict or civil war or disorganizations or just like a straight up race war with sponsoring people or helping people like David Duke. His strategy for destroying the United States is to start a race war, civil war and cause unrest. So if Dugan had his way to be 100% real with you, it would be with David Duke leading an army against Caleb Malpin leaning an army against the Haru, the Haru, the, what are they called? The Aruhu movement? I forget what they're called. But it would be like these three just extremists just tearing each other apart as Biden leads from a bunker in DC. He also wrote on the same page, while doing this, we must simultaneously support isolationist tendencies in American politics. Those circles, often right-wing Republicans, he wrote that, not me. I didn't put that in parentheses. That was him. Believe the USA should confide itself to its own internal problems. The position Russia has been placed in is supremely favorable. So let me just say people like Rand Paul is somebody he would give a big old thumbs up to. Also, if you're curious what all, let's say that everything he did succeeded, which is absolutely insane to think, but let's for a moment pretend that everything he ever did or strive for here succeeded. This is a map of what Russia would look like with over 400 million people within its borders, more than well over doubling its population, making the world's largest nation that much larger. So we can see that Alexander Dugan is an insane imperialist fascist who wants to take over large swaths of land because America piss him off because consumerism, to simplify it. Alexander Dugan's also been extremely critical of Vladimir Putin. In 2017, he said, I think that he doesn't understand what he's saying because now he's a liberal, now a conservative, now he's for sovereignty, now for globalism, and now against globalism, basically calling him a flip-flop because Dugan's a hardliner. But how much influence does he really have over the Russian government? Well, it's actually hard to say. Scholars greatly disagree. You're going to see him a lot more in Western media than you're going to see him necessarily in other forms of media because he's very good at just plain Western, um, you know, Western reporters and making him seem possibly more significant than he actually is. And I would also say, I think a lot of Westerners just like to see a crazy Russian man with a long beard to like fill that Rasputin vibe they have in their head for like the person behind the scenes pulling the strings. And I think this is most clearly shown by the fact that he has no official links with the current government. There's no photographs of him like shaking hands with Vladimir Putin. But this is at the same time while people are writing articles like Alexander Dugan, Putin's brain. But I, a lot of these people would, would, would counter this by saying they could have met uh, in private or that he doesn't need to meet Alexander Dugan to be influenced by his ideas, which I do agree with. Now, the thing that makes people think, including me, that he might still have a significant amount of influence or, or at least a notable amount of influence, and I would lean more towards notable amount of influence, is that everything he would need to do to kind of like form this Eurasian empire Mo, 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 like Putin has been kind of following that pattern, right? And they do have some significant agreements. Like both of them think that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest disaster of the 20th century. Both of them agree with that sentiment, even though he was part of a monarchist organization in the late 80s. His beliefs do seem to be following the path Putin follows today, whether it be in Georgia or with ultranationalism or the denial of Ukraine's right to exist, the decay of civil liberties or the destabilization of the United States. That's the one that really gets me is that his prescription on how to destabilize the United States seems to in large part be exactly what the Russian state is doing. And that's the one that really gets me. He also has had some governmental positions, some of them influential. In 1999, he became special advisor to the then Duma speaker, Gennady Selzvenev, that same year with the help of leadership of Russia's nationalist and very misnamed Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, Dugan became the chairman of the geopolitical section of the Duma's Advisory Council on National Security. And more importantly, this big work I just told you that had all of that insanity in it, all of that ridiculousness in it, it is required reading at the General Staff Academy for every Russian military officer above the rank of colonel. It's on the reading list at the Russian Military Academy. The, the book that talks about destabilizing the United States annexing Ukraine, annexing these large swaths of territory, annexing Finland, which is about to become a NATO member, it's in the reading list. So I would, I would say he might not be a modern Rasputin, but he is influential over the Russian far right. His books are taught to the Russian military, and he has been influential over a lot of Russian nationalist politicians. 
And I know that Putin knows of him definitely after the recent assassination of his daughter. So the question is now, will that change the amount of influence he has over Russian politics? And will Putin follow his framework? Who knows? Hopefully not, though. Because again, the man's a maniac. And one last thing. Some people have asked me whether I should have sympathy for the woman that was killed in the assassination, the same one calling for the war crimes and calling Ukrainians subhuman and calling for the annihilation of Ukraine and push for the war and try to, you know, dehumanize Ukraines, make it easier for Russian soldiers to commit, to, to, to rationalize these acts in their own head before going out to Ukraine to commit these acts of, uh, of brutality and these atrocities. People ask me, shouldn't I feel sympathy for him or Dugan? No. No, I don't. I don't feel any sympathy. Zero. It's hard for me to see somebody advocate for the destruction of another nation state, call for prisoners of war to be tortured and executed in front of civilians, call the population they're brutalizing subhuman, and then they die, and I'm supposed to feel sympathy when I'm interacting with these people that are feeling the full effects of both of these people's ideologies every day? No. I only have enough sympathy to hand around, and I'm going to hand it to the civilians that are killed by the Russian invasion. Not these two fascists. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. If you could like, comment, help with the algorithm, I would really appreciate it. And my Patreon is relaunched, and I would really appreciate it if you funded my Patreon so I could do more projects like this and spend more time researching and less time worrying about gathering money for my trips in Ukraine to film or my time researching here. Thank you very much. Have a good one.